Welcome back to the Midlife Makeover Show. I'm Wendy Valentine, and today we have the incredible pleasure of hosting Heather Chauvin. I hope I said that right. A distinguished leadership coach who specializes in helping successful women live, work, and parent courageously and authentically on their own terms. Heather began her career as a social worker, guiding adults in understanding children's behavior. However, her life took a transformative turn in 2013 when she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. This life-altering experience propelled her to challenge deep-seated cultural expectations and uncover how they often sabotage our dreams. In today's episode, we'll dive into Heather's philosophy of living fearlessly. Oh, yeah. Discuss how cultural expectations can hold us back and explore practical steps to reclaiming our power and passion. Heather's story is not just inspiring. It's a call to action for all of us to live a life where we truly feel alive. Today's conversation just might change the way you approach your own journey. I hope it does. Please welcome Heather to the show. Ba, ba, ba. Thank you, Wendy. I'm excited. I'm loving your energy. And I could just tell you're you're my kind of people. I know. I was telling you like before, uh, before we started, I was watching your TED Talk on your website and mm-hmm. I loved it. It was very engaging and it was just like to the point, which sometimes I feel like, especially when you get to this point in life, I feel like let's just come like the dog ate the cat. Like, let's like, like let's just get to the point. Like, you know, like none of the yeah. bullshit. And actually you talked about that, about, oh, balance is bullshit. Mm-hmm. I love that. I, yeah, I had it up on my slide and I was like, am I going to get in trouble for this? I asked for permission, but that's the question all women ask me. It's a very age old question, but it's like, how do I balance it all? And I'm like, what is your definition of balance? And why, like, what does that mean? Because even that term feels like it has perfectionism behind it. So um oh totally it's all about perfectionism and what's in the expectations of society and our families and friends and social media it's yeah it's just crap Mm -hmm. I I just it and I feel like when you let go of that things kind of fall into place easier they just flow yeah yeah you have to really get clear on what you want instead of what everyone else wants from you which is i find the actual question they're asking i know yeah so take us back take us back before was it december 21st 2013 did i get that right yes it was it's interesting i always say it's interesting or it's funny because that was like 10 plus years ago and I do not identify, I do not identify as like a cancer survivor. I'm using air quotes. It feels like it was a dream and so long ago, but it was also, you know, we hear people with these heroic stories of surviving cancer or climbing a mountain or doing whatever. And I never wanted to be associated with my cancer story. Um, and Wendy, that wasn't even like the thing that cracked me open It was the thing that gave me permission to live, but Mm. nine years before my cancer diagnosis, I was into personal development. I was already like, I've always been an outside of the box thinker, identifying as a rebel. Um, even as a child and a teenager, I was the questioner. I would ask like Mm. my teachers, like, why do we have to learn that? That doesn't make sense. And I was not the people pleaser. So people would say to me, like, stop asking questions. Just do what you're supposed to do. Like get the good mark and do the thing. And I'm like, but how are good marks going to like, help me be successful out in the world. So I had those critical thinking Mm. skills, but I was not, um, rewarded for them. Mm. And what happened was I developed a story that like, I'm not smart. I'm not an intelligent Mm. person and I'm never going to go anywhere. And I went down this rabbit hole. I was a severely depressed teenager in hindsight, realizing I was just so sensitive. And when I say sensitive, I had a gift for empathy and connection. But the shadow side of that, of course, is like 
burnout and shutting down and retreating. And I didn't know these were my coping strategies. Um, and I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. I got pregnant at the age of 18. Um, I became a mother. I was a single mom and I made the decision. I'm going to be all in on parenting. And the, and this is, was my first aha moment, which leads to the cancer story. So when I looked at my son the first time, I remember having this feeling like I can't fail at this job. Like mm -hmm. I cannot fail at this primal role of being a quote unquote mother. Like if I do this, like I have failed, but I already felt like I was failing because I was doing things backwards. So that was when the underperformer became the overperformer. Ah. Uh. And that was when I started to do all the things I kind of let go and abandoned that rebel. Mm. And I still had the critical thinking skills, but I was like, you got to tone her down because you got to be a good mother. And I'm using air quotes, good mom, good woman, good human. <laughs> so then I start checking the boxes, what society wants me to do for the first time in my life. And I'm like, go to school, check you know, do all the things, check, check, check. And externally, everyone's like, oh my gosh, you're doing it all. Pat on the back. Internally, I physically was like, I am dying. Like, mm. this is not sustainable. I kept, I already had that feeling of like mentally and physically, like I can't do this. And mm. when I was seeking help, like literally going to therapy at a young age, I was like, they're like, honey, this is adulthood. You know, mm. here, here's a meditation book here. Go listen to this. Go. And I'm like, what? Like, I just, I was, it was shell shock. Like I was traumatized. So I kept at it. Like, like being stressed as a mother is like normal. Like, okay. Yeah. That's what, that's the way it's supposed to be. Like deal yeah. with it. Suck it up. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, you know, I'm not going to, you do the best you can with what you have. And I was yeah. searching, I was seeking support, but it was those one-off things, right? Like I never had that mentor or adult, regardless, male or female, I never had that role model in my life that was like, if you keep down this path, you're going to burn out. Like, you got to do this. You got to do this. Like, I didn't have that person that like embodied who I wanted to become. I would mm -hmm. see women who were like, yep, you either go full force in your career or you go full force in mothering. And yep. either way, they weren't technically, I'm not even going to say balanced people, but they weren't happy either way. So I'm like, what is going on? Why is there not one human that I can find who feels alive and energized and mm -hmm. satisfied in all areas of their life? In all areas, right. Yep. So fast forward, I leave my career as a social worker because I realized I... I was not making an impact. I was just perpetuating systems of oppression. So I'm like, if I want to make an impact, I got to use my own voice. So I leave, start a business, start podcasting like 10 years ago, like way before wow. it was cool. Yeah. Going down the rabbit hole of like a little Facebook ad, finding this woman talking about business and she's wearing ripped jeans. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love this. Like, who is this person being themselves? So I, I learn about all of these things, but there was one thing missing, which was giving myself permission to mm. embody what I wanted. Mm. And so I felt like I was filling my cup in certain areas. Like when I was diagnosed in 2013, I felt confident in my mothering, in my parenting. I was like, okay, that bucket, I'm getting some momentum there. Um, I kind of know what I'm doing. My marriage was decent financially crap mm. building my business. So there was some buckets that were full, some that were less, but my body was never my health in general, but my body was never a conversation. Like my mm -hmm. physical health was never a conversation because mm. externally I looked lean or mm -hmm. quote unquote skinny. So why do you take care of yourself if you don't have fat to lose, right? Why do you take yeah, care yeah. of yourself? You don't have, if you're not overweight. And so just all of this BS that we're taught as women, but I knew energetically mm -hmm. that I was depleted. So mm -hmm. I had no idea where to start. And it wasn't until my diagnosis that I was like, okay, I have checked the suffering box. Um, I am, I'm all in. And I'm going to stop like pretending that I'm like 
just dipping my toe in the water. I have to figure out how to feel alive and aligned or mm. like, I have no other option. I'm going to die. Mm. That is such a great story. And I, I, when I watched you on your, um, the TEDx talk and the picture stands out to me where it looks like you're pregnant, but it's actually the tumors. Yeah. Yeah. My and then you, and you had made the comment how you had a little bit of a smile and how that's so common of society to like, okay, the woman still needs to smile even though she's dying. Yeah. Yep. My abdomen was swollen when I first went in and they did like a CT and blood work and on the spot told me I had little sporadic tumors all over my abdomen. Um, and within weeks, like that picture, it's in my book too. It was within like a week or two, it just blew up and I, it, the cancer grew so fast. And I remember taking that photo, which I think was the day before my treatment started. Um, and I, you know, it's like, take a picture. And I was like, why am I smiling? Like I was physically mm. dying. Like my body was deteriorating, but once we got a diagnosis, like it was moving so fast. And you had mentioned the, the greatest thing that cancer taught you was just giving you permission. Yeah. Yeah. Permission, permission to, to what? To embody the feeling of being alive. And mm. that was kind of where that my pivotal moments. So like when I had my diagnosis, I physically remember leaving the hospital and looking up at the sky and I have my own. I think we all have our own relationship with, you know, spirit mm -hmm. or higher power, whatever our belief systems are. And I grew up Roman Catholic and, but not like fully, you know, the rebel in me was like, but why, but why, but why? Mm -hmm. So I had like a fractured relationship to any, something bigger than me. And I remember physically leaving the hospital that night going, you finally have my attention. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know who I'm talking to, what I'm talking to but I will listen, meaning like mm -hmm. I will listen to my intuition. I will listen to, uh, the whispers. I will listen yeah. to signs. I, and I, I like completely surrendered. Um, and I knew that everything kind of prepared me for that moment. And it was, I felt like it was go time, like all the personal development I was doing, all the relational stuff I learned like diving into conscious parenting at the beginning. I'm like, I was just training for this moment and now I had to really lean in and figure out how to embody how yeah. I wanted to feel in my life. That was the word I was just going to say again. It's like, that's key embody. Mm -hmm. Someone had mentioned that, uh, said something to me not too long ago. And to me that really stuck out because I think that's right. Like we, you and I were saying even earlier about even conversations that are just on the surface. Like I can't even handle those anymore. I'm just like, can we talk about real stuff, like real life? And, yes. and so we hear a lot of things we absorb, obviously nowadays with social media and YouTube and all sorts of stuff. And Netflix, we receive tons of information. Yeah. And it, it, I feel like sometimes myself included, like it might just sit there, but is it really, are you really embodying that, that wisdom Mm -hmm. Like making it a part of you and living your life like that. So many times, like, we'll like, we'll say things and do things, but are like, are you really, really being that? Yeah. Yeah. And I see it with my clients all the time because I yeah. work like, I mean, we work, I don't necessarily work one-on-one -on -one with people, but it's like in intimate settings. And these are women who are juggling a lot in their lives, whether they're business owners or whether they're like, they have teams and children in the sandwich generation mm -hmm. of taking care of all these people. And I watch it every single day where I'm like, you're running away. Like you yeah. can tell I, I always say I'm reading human behavior as a language. They're like, I don't know why this isn't working. Like I've read the book. I listened to the podcast. Like I've done the worksheet. And I'm like, just because you're checking the boxes doesn't mean you're actually courageously doing the thing you need to mm -hmm. do and leaning into the resistance and the fear, right? Like if you have, yeah. I always use the um, journal prompt. Wouldn't it be nice if, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be nice if, like you said, like, 
get rid of everything, sell it all, travel yep. the world, do your thing. You keep writing that on your, wouldn't it be nice list. And you just, yeah. you keep bypassing it. And it's like, those desires are inside of you for a reason. The next right. step is not create another plan. The next step is have the courage to go have the conversation, to go lean mm -hmm. in, to go do the research, to say, this is happening, have a deadline. And yeah. I see that with people, they get right to the edge and, wow. and, but they don't jump all the way in. And I'm like, that's, that was what was missing for me when the diagnosis happened, because I'm like, you know, I always had this sense of what's my purpose and, yeah. um, you know, what's the point of being here? What's the point of life? What's the, you know, how do I get that sense of purpose and meaning? But I was just always living on the edge of it and I didn't yeah. dive in. How do you think you get the courage? Well, I'm hoping nothing bad needs to happen to anybody. Yep. But that is the beauty of contrast sometimes when shit hits the fan in your life. Mm -hmm. um, you, It just puts things in your face of like, it, mir it mirrors back to you, right? I say this to women all the time, especially when it comes to money. I'm like, unless you have to make your own money, um, you're going to avoid looking at your money. And I'm like, so when you are starting a business or you're doing your thing, I'm like, not only do you need financial literacy skills, but you need to be responsible for maybe paying some of those bills so you can make yourself emotionally uncomfortable because mm -hmm. you know you may have money, but you won't feel empowered with your money. And it's the exact same thing, like make yourself emotionally uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I actually changed my podcast name. It used to be called Mom is in Control, which I never liked that name which because I was attracting women, they wanted to feel in control of their lives. And now I'm all about get yourself emotionally uncomfortable. Like if you were like, exactly, I'm, yeah. you're like, I'm stuck. I'm numb. I I'm mm -hmm. comfortable. I'm like, well, what do you want? Well, I don't know what I want. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. You do know what you want. You just won't give yourself permission to lean in. Yeah. And so courage can literally be writing down what you think you want. Yes. Like leaning in and then testing some of it. And that's where we have to pay attention to perfectionism and expectation and fear. People of being pleasing. Judged. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, there was a quote that you, which is one of my fave quotes too. Um, Stephen Pressfield, most of us have two lives, the life we live and the unlived life within us mm -hmm. between the two stands resistance. Resistance. Yeah. Yeah. I never understood what resistance was <laughs> at all because it is very easy to busy yourself um, and avoid doing the thing that you know you need to do. Like you have yeah. to have some silence and space to be like, oh, I want this. Oh, but I just don't have time for it versus I'm yep. going to create space to look at it and mm -hmm. then watch how resistant you are. Or we, we point it to something outside of us. Mm -hmm. We're blaming some, someone or some situation yeah. as to why we can't actually follow our dreams and fulfill our purpose. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I can't do it because I'm busy doing this or he's got to do that. And I've got to take the kids here and blah, blah. I mean, I did it. Mm -hmm. I did it for a long time. And when I started this journey, um, driving an RV across the country and starting the show, I was like, okay. And I felt like there was something still stuck. Even as much work as I had done, um, I still felt there was something there that just, I was like, what, what is it? Like, what is standing in my way? Mm -hmm. Really going balls out. And I realized through a ketamine journey, <laughs> before I started my journey, um, it was me. Mm-hmm. I was the one standing in my way and it sounds cuckoo crazy. And I'm totally okay with that. But I pretty much had a conversation with my soul and my soul said, I need for you to get out of my way. Cause I got shit to do. I was like, Oh, okay. So you got this. Okay. Well, I'll just take all my limiting beliefs and shove them because we don't need them anymore. Yep. And it's interesting. Like what, happens when you do give yourself permission to live fully mm -hmm. and to just god to just be and 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 i mean I, to me i feel like with courage 
it is taking that action, giving yourself permission, taking action. And the more you action that you take, then you'll build up that jar of courage Yeah. to where, to where you're like, you don't even, it's hard to not take a leap anymore. Yeah. And I feel like when you're on the other side of it and people are like, oh, must be nice. Oh my gosh. Like your life. Or they say comments and you're like, if you only knew, like when you are living your life fully aligned, or at least trying to have this courageous life, like you're in it all the time. Like you're constantly managing that, like inner experience and relationship, Mm -hmm. like with your soul. Uh, lately in the past two years, well, one, my teenager, I mean, that was like very intriguing the last few years, like navigating the last few years of high school through COVID, all of that, the challenge within me, but having this conversation about with myself, about my work where I'm like, why can't I just be normal? Like that's my go-to question Mm -hmm. that I'm like, why can't I just be normal? Why can't I go get a job? Why? Like, that's when I want to back out. And then I'm like, okay, go down that path. It's just me resisting my, I say purpose, but I also have like a weird relationship with like, you cannot just find your sole purpose in your work um, and certain relationships. It's like, you are your purpose. Like you just have to listen. So I think about, well, what type of work do I want to do then? And it's usually just me resistant to leaning mm-hmm. into what feels good and alive and aligned. Yeah. And you know what? A lot of times too, we think purpose means vocation. Like that is yes. your career. Well, that's, how they, mean, that's how it's marketed. I know. I know. Yeah. yeah and awful. I did for like the longest time, like probably 10 years. What's my purpose? What's my... And I kept like dabbling in all sorts of different things. And I was avoiding what I'm doing right now. Because Which is what? just being you. Just being Wendy. Yeah. And just sharing my wisdom and sharing my light and, and I always felt like that's not enough. Mm. I have to have something concrete and I've got to be like that person or that person or that person. Yeah. And yeah, fitting inside the box when you actually think outside the box, it's hard. Like when you have like a wild soul that just wants a whoop and I'm like, but that doesn't fit in with society's norms. Right. Yeah. And that's what I found too. Like after I went from, I'm going to say like in person to online, and this is like way before people knew about it. Like I remember trying to get people to talk to me on zoom with, they're like, no, what is that? Like Skype back in the day. Yeah. And now they're like, what you want to meet in person? Like it swung to the other side of the pendulum, (laughs) but it, there is like, we have to be mindful that every, I have like a hair in my eye. Everything is (laughs) somebody else's story. And so even if somebody has this wild soul, Mm -hmm. their way of being and working and playing and living is not necessarily going to be the way you want. And this is my favorite thing to teach people because I have to do this now. It's called my energetic time management process. But I find when I'm feeling stuck or even when you get the thing, you do the thing and you're like, I got here. Why am I not happy? Why am I not satisfied? Like I thought once Mm -hmm. I sell everything, this is going to be great. Like for me, I'm like, I'm like, okay, once I hit this goal or once I hit this revenue or once my child is this age or whatever, then I will be insert. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're still doing the same thing. We're like, oh, that person, the whole laptop lifestyle or like being on a beach all the time. It's not rainbows and kitty cats, but we're not searching. We're not like, um, we're seeking a feeling. We're not yeah. seeking a thing. Um, so I started doing my list of wouldn't it be nice if, and I still do this to this day. And I just write out like, what is it that I crave? And if mm-hmm. you actually really give yourself permission to listen and feel alive and aligned and go after what you want. It will change. It will change every year. It will change seasonally. And you watch like, what, what are the common denominators? And then I tell people, put the feeling next to the desire, which might be abundant, alive. I'm like, no one's ever going to say, I want to feel like crap. I want to be in debt. I want to feel like shit. I want to feel disrespected. Like it's always abundant, you know, positive experiences. And then take that word and ask yourself, what makes me feel that way? 
Mm-hmm. And what do I, what lights me up in my work currently? Which parts do I not like? And yeah. how can I get more of what I want and desire, not comparing to how somebody else is doing it? Yeah. It's funny. I was at, um, I had gotten trained at the Chopra Center and um, Deepak had came into the room and he wasn't supposed to present or anything, but he just popped in for like a couple of minutes to say hi. And I was sitting there and he's like, he had these cute little uh, he had like red Converse leather shoes on and red glittery glasses. I was just like sitting there staring at him. And the only thing I remember him saying is you have to feel your way through life. And I was like, and in the moment in my life, it was like, I was about to go through a divorce. I was like, just, I was a mess. And I remember we went out on a break and um, I took my shoes off and I was walking in the grass and I was just feeling the grass. And he's like, you have to feel your way through life. And I was like, feel your way through life. I was like, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. And then I was like, oh, okay. Well, what, how do I want to feel? Like, I want to feel like how I do, like when I'm walking along the grass, it feels peaceful and soothing. And, and ever since then, I started to think that way or feel that way mm-hmm. and, and started guiding myself towards how I wanted to feel. I let my heart guide me instead of my beliefs or my brain or whatever family and friends wanted me to do. Right. Cause I have found though, I don't know about you, but like, if, if you leap into something that's kind of like crazy and wild for, you know, society's norms, people's, their fears will creep up. Like, even when I was like, you know what, I'm selling everything. I'm quitting my job, I'm buying an RV. I'm taking off cross country. And you're like, Oh, oh my God. They're like, Oh, we can't believe you're going to do that. I'm like, are you scared for me? Or is it like you're putting yourself in my shoes mm-hmm. and therefore you're putting your limiting beliefs and your fears upon me. So you, I feel like when you, when you want to make that leap into your life, you have to shut out the noise of everybody else's bullshit mm-hmm. because you'll start to listen to it. And then you go mm, right back to where you were. Yes. And I remember a specific moment when I was going through treatment that taught me this lesson. So remember, I've always been a little bit of a disruptor. So (laughs) typically when I'm doing something and I'm feeling the disruption of other people's energy, um, before it never used to bother me. I'm finding the older I get, I I'm like catching myself caring a little bit more and it's not so much because it's my kids or my husband, but I, I don't know if it's because I have more life experience now. My brain is more developed and it's like, Oh, okay. I shouldn't, I shouldn't ruffle any feathers. I shouldn't make other people uncomfortable. So, but I remember this moment specifically, I was like at my rock bottom, I was at the hospital and people started finding out that I was sick. And they were, I watched, I, it was like slow motion, like a movie. I could watch how they were like, I call it emotionally puking. Like they're just mm-hmm. so uncomfortable and they have very little emotional regulation or emotional intelligence skills. And it was just like, they were just like throwing it on me. And I was watching it like the matrix where I'm like, nope. And I just like push it back. Like mm. visualize that I had like a, a platter and I'm just flinging it back to them. <laughs> I like <But> that. <laughs> also, I mean, like, yeah, when you're like healthy and you're living your life, you're not paying attention to this, but it happens every day. I tell people like, you know, it's happening at work. It's happening in the house. That's why you feel so overwhelmed a lot of the times because you're yeah. carrying other people's stuff. Yeah. So I remember this moment though, where I was like, oh my gosh look at the codependency that I have created with other people. I am their Mm. rock. And when their rock is broken, they don't know how to live. And that was my first aha moment of like being what I, I identify now as a recovering rescuer. But back then I didn't realize that I was rescuing everybody else's emotions. Like, Hey, I need you. I'm having a bad day. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'm going for a walk. Let's talk. We're now when people enter my life and I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, I am your friend. I'm not free therapy. Like Mm -hmm. I get value from this relationship too. And I don't want to 
just give, 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 give all the time. I want it to be a reciprocal relationship. So you feel it differently when you learn to have different boundaries, to communicate differently, to show up differently. But yeah. when I'm making changes in my life now and I see the disruption, I'm like, okay, that's when I know it's working because other people yes. are uncomfortable too. So interesting. Yeah. You're but that's so the energy similar. you're changing. Yeah. You're changing the ecosystem. You are the culture creator of your life. So when you change the ecosystem, just think about nature, yeah. everything else changed when the soil's not working, the trees aren't growing. Like it's fascinating to watch and observe how we all affect each other. Think about how many people, if you stop drinking or you change mm -hmm. certain lifestyle patterns. Like now I like going to the gym. I love walking. So when people are like, you want to come over and do this? I'm like, how about we go for a walk? Like mm -hmm. if they're, if they're not the type that likes to walk, I'm never going to see them. Yeah. And you know what? I find that a lot of people will not change because they are scared of the change that will happen within their relationships, the whole dynamic. Yeah. And so they end up not leaping because they're afraid of how is that person going to react? And what if I don't do it right? Then they're going to be upset with me. And then how do I manage when it comes down to you just, you got to take care of yourself. It's not yeah. your responsibility to take care of everybody else's feelings and their reactions. People are going to react the way that they're going to react, right? They're going to handle things the way that they handle things. But I was just like you, I mean, the rescuer, the fixer, the people pleaser, the the perfectionist. I mean, good God, it was exhausting. It's exhausting internally, but yes. when you've always been that person, even yep. as a small child, you're used to being exhausted. Yep. So, and then you go to the doctor and say, I'm exhausted. They do some blood work and say, you're fine. And then, you know, you go somewhere else and they're like, oh, well, take these supplements. And then you're like, Oh, rest, sleep more. And you're like, it's not working. Nobody ever mm -hmm. talks about emotional exhaustion. No one ever talks about soul exhaustion. Yeah. And, you know, you could talk about your problems all day long, but when you don't like ask yourself, what is the life I want to be living? And the first time you ask yourself that you may not get an answer. Yes. And then you just have to slowly, like i you know, we all know, I'm sure anytime you've made big leaps, you're like, I knew for years that I needed yeah. to get the divorce or leave or do whatever, yeah. but I was just scared. But then, you know, women come into my world. They're like, I think I might be splitting up with my partner. And I'm like, okay, but you don't need to make that decision today. Let's get you right. stronger. And then it just naturally mm -hmm. unfolds. Yeah. And I always tell the story about like my husband and I have been together since my little one was, or my oldest was a year and a half. So we've been together for, I don't know, 18 ish years. Mm -hmm. And he's seen me through everything. Like he's seen me single, you know, depressed, bald, all mm -hmm. the things. And there's been many iterations in our relationship, but there was one in particular. Remember I came into this like Miss Independent. So that's my coping strategies, like hyper independence. And I found it more difficult to be in a relationship than, you know, by myself. And so, <laughs> but there was one moment in particular where I was on my personal development journey. And I believe this was after my diagnosis and I got to a point where I felt like I wouldn't do a lot because I wanted to bring my husband along. I'm like, come on, come on, come on, because I was afraid I was going to lose him if I grew too fast. Mm. And I hear this from women all the time. Yep. And I just flat out looked at him one day and I said, I love you so much, but I am no longer willing to abandon my needs, my dreams, my goals for this one precious life that I have you are yeah. welcome to come along with the journey or that like, it's okay, but this yeah. is your choice. And for whatever reason he heard me, but the courage it took me to have that conversation and be like, I'm okay if this doesn't last and I'm not mm. angry. I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep running this life race and I want to feel amazing. And I'm going to travel the world with the boys. You're welcome to come along if you want. And yeah. For whatever reason, it's making, it's making your happiness and your fulfillment a priority. Yeah. And because I had the courage to not control other people's behavior, 
Mm -hmm. And by osmosis, I've watched how that has inspired other people. And I say you trigger or you inspire other people and they will come along if they want, or they will be so triggered that they will just naturally remove themselves from you. So it's interesting. I'm thinking of my own life here and um, so many times throughout the decades that people have even shared with me and people I've been married to. Um, that my light is basically intimidating. Don't shine so much, Wendy. Don't, don't be so bubbly. Don't be so giggly. Don't be so happy. Don't be. So I translated that to being, okay, I need to like dumb myself down here. I need to stop shining so brightly because, and then as like my number one limiting belief that I've had since a child was my fear of being abandoned Mm -hmm. because I was abandoned as a child. So therefore, Wendy translates to that to, okay, if I shine my light, if I am Wendy and completely and fully, and I really, really shine, that means they're not going to like me. They're not going to love me. And they, I will be abandoned. Mm-hmm. So for decades, I literally hung on to that. And I feel like you, like you hang on to it without even like putting that into words to yourself. Yeah. It's just there, right? It's just stuck in there. It's like, this is what, this is how we manage our life. And then until finally I woke up like, wait a minute, this doesn't seem to be right. (laughs) I'm miserable not being Wendy. And I had to the same thing go, you know what? If I have to get a divorce in order for me to be happy and healthy, in order for me to live my life fully, so be it. Yeah. It just wasn't, I was killing myself Mm -hmm. by not, by not, uh, standing up for myself. Yeah. And it's fascinating. Cause I, when I wrote my book, dying to be a good mother, people are like it, I, Mm -hmm. I get mixed reviews. Like some people I'm like, this is a book that you may not be able to gift somebody because it may be too heavy for them. There was, I remember I was at an event and I met this man and I did a little talk and it was like co-ed. He's like, this is an amazing book. I'm going to give it to my wife. And I said, it might trigger her. And he like took, cause it was like, she's like, what do you think I am? Like, she took offense to it. Like, she's not a good enough mother. And I was like, no, no, no. That is like the worst thing you could tell a woman possible. But I'm like, it's interesting to see how, like, I was dying to be a good mother, like over mothering, over compensating, over nurturing. And there's that self abandonment piece. And yet, you know, when people are like, what's your one secret, which I think that's a BS, there's no secrets, but they're like, mm-hmm. what's one thing you want to be known for? And I'm like, the more alive you feel, the more you, you feel that is the secret we're looking in every single book that you read. I have like yeah. five right here. Like the more you, you are, and you're like, does that work yeah. for me? Does that align for me? If the answer is no, like, don't, do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't do exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's uh, interesting. Just in the last year, I had realized here I was, I had this fear of being abandoned when really what it came down to, I was abandoning me. Yourself. Yeah. Yes. And I was like, oh my God, that's awful. I was like, no more of that. Like, forget it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're so right. I feel like the more that you are yourself and, in, and you, And that's a process too. Like you don't really, it's not like you wake up and go, I'm finally me. No, in the doing, then you discover the being, right? Like you, you go, okay, this, this is, feels more like me. Like, okay, I'm going to do more of that. And it's, it's an experiment really, because I think you even mentioned this in your talk about the unlearning, you have Mm -hmm. to unlearn all of that, that you've like picked up along the way. Yeah. Along all the decades of life that you've lived thus far, like you've picked up stuff that has not worked for you. And then you have to unlearn that. You have to shed that away from you. Yeah. And then it's like uh, the statue of David, right? Like when uh, Michelangelo carved the statue of David, he carved away everything that was not him. And mm. then he got to his true to the statue of David. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Like you, it takes time to carve. I'm still, I mean, I think I'll be carving away till the day I die. I feel like that is the purpose oh. of life though. Yeah. Like how, I don't know if mine's going to do yeah, it. Yeah, I know. I just got to, that song's up on my screen. 
Oh, look, now you have fireworks. This and is fireworks. so, yeah, I sometimes I'll be in like a serious meeting and it's like thumbs up and I'm like, oh gosh, this is hilarious. But I love the the balloons, all of the things. Yeah, if you're, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see. If you're not, we it's have so fireworks funny. on our screen. But yeah, yeah it's, like it's probably because you're using the Mac uh, yeah. camera. I'm not using that. But when I'm on my laptop, it's absolutely hilarious and it shows up at I the know. worst times uh, possible. Um, but what I, I'm like, what was I going to say? Oh, you know what the interesting part about this is like, we're having like the big conversation of like, who yeah. am I, you know, which can be a very overwhelming and intimidating yeah. question for people. And I thought like when I started my business, it was the parent child relationship. And then it went to helping women manage their energy and their time. And then these women who are leading teams and doing the things, and they're like, I need more revenue. I need more profit. I need more whatever. And I'm like, listen, when I asked the question of like, what feels good to you? Do you want to do that? Like the unlearning, not even just who am I as an individual, but like, do I want to run this business anymore? Do I want to offer this service anymore? Am I just trying to please mm -hmm. my clients? Am I reacting because of the economy? And it's like, we're not asking ourselves these questions. And what I realized was I was teaching people deep self trust. They're like, well, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, I can tell you what to do and you're going to build out this whole thing. And your guts are literally going to be saying mm -hmm. to you, not this, not this. And you're going to be pushing through because you're like, this equals success. And I'm like, no, it doesn't yeah. success. You still have to show up. You still have to do things you don't want to do, but you have to learn the difference mm -hmm. between what is resistance and mm -hmm. I'm about to have a breakthrough versus that is not the path for me. And the only way you're going to be able to do that, unfortunately, is by testing it, like yes, the courage exactly. to try, right? Yep. So, but when you're a perfectionist and you're taught there is one right way, this is why people wake up midlife and they're like, WTF, who am I? I'm like, because yep. you've been checking the boxes of who everyone else wanted you to be. Exactly. It's funny. Yeah. I was talking to this couple yesterday at the hot tub here, in the RV park. <laughs> and I they were it. like so inspired by the fact that I live in Portugal half the year, then RV the other half the year. And they're like, yeah, we were thinking about moving to Italy. And then you could feel like their, their fears were like, oh my gosh, but what if this and what if that? I'm like, nothing's permanent. Yeah. So what if you sell the house that is probably way too big now that the, you know, the birdies have left the nest. So what if you sell that house, you sell everything, you go to Italy, you have a great time and you go, you know what? I don't know if we really should stay living here. Who cares? You try Everything's to temporary. Life is temporary anyways. I know. I yeah. know. Yeah. I know. I used to, uh, I used to study the course of miracles. It was like one of my favorite things. And that was probably the biggest uh, thing that came out of that whole thing was like, it's, this is all temporary. Yeah. And I, I had shared with you, I uh, had interviewed hospice nurse, Julie, which her episode will come out in a few weeks, but we had this amazing conversation about death, which mm -hmm. teaches you about life. Yeah. Like everyone. Yes. Look we're all going to die. Like that's a guarantee, but how are you going to live? Yeah. That has been one yeah. of my, I would say one of my biggest challenges. Uh, it's coming back around for whatever reason. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because my, my family's getting older, but I live with the yeah. duality on the daily basis. Like, I feel like I'm always riding the fence of, I am very aware that life is temporary and I'm also like, there's beauty in that and there's fear in that. So which one am I going to grab onto? So when I can feel the, like, I'm afraid, what if something bad happens and your kids get older and you have less control? And I'm like, it's duality. Like this moment is precious. This moment is beautiful. This mm -hmm. is life. This is it. This is all you have. And when you're present in the moment, you know, you're like, oh, that's beautiful. And then the next second you could be triggered and you're like, now I'm scared. And to me, the game yeah. is that emotional regulation of like, am I going to reach for the future vision of what I, mm -hmm. what my soul is craving? Or am I going to like be stuck and live in the past of what, you know, what if, right? right. So, or what could be, and it's like this, it's all a game and mm -hmm. we just have to like pick and choose our own adventure and 
I choose the one that feels good, which is not always, I say it's not always easy. It's just emotionally uncomfortable. Yeah. And I would say if you're scared of something, ask yourself why you're scared, like really get underneath that. I mean, I still have things that trigger me sometimes on a daily basis and I'll stop. I'm like, all right, Wendy, what is, what's going on here? You know, you have to like kind of coach yourself through it and go, what's underneath this? Are you really like, are you scared because something really, really bad is going to happen? And what if whatever you're thinking did happen? Is it that bad? Yeah. Don't you like, you've been through some serious shit in life. I'm pretty sure you're going to be just fine. So it's like getting underneath those fears and not attaching to them. Now, don't you have to believe the fear? It could be, the fear could be total BS. Yeah. Something like, just about, like me, right? Like the, the limited belief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm all about befriending your fear. Like I yeah. talk to my emotions as if they mm-hmm. are a toddler trying to get my attention. I'm like, why are you here? And what do you need from me? And oftentimes when I do that exercise with people, they're like, Oh, it's just trying to protect me. And I'm like, yeah, but when you, when you like abandon the fear or the guilt and you're like, go away, go away. Or you start living from that place. You live from a place of scarcity. But when you're like, why are you here? And it's like, I'm just here to protect you. Okay. What do you need from me to feel safe? I need you to have that conversation. You don't want to have, I need you to take that courageous action. And then it's like, you're co-creating your life with fear instead of allowing it to run the show. Yeah. And fears, I mean, fear is normal, like as a human being, fight or flight and freeze, all that stuff. It's normal that our body, our minds react to certain things, but that doesn't mean you have to buy into it. Yes. When people yeah. say, how do you get over fear? What I hear them say is, how do I not feel my feelings? And I'm like, exactly. good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So you've got the podcast. You also provide, um, do you do one-on-one coaching? No. So no. okay. if they go to my, um, my website, Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N.com, um, they'll see how I can, you know, how I work with people and we have retreats and all the things, but I hang out a lot on my podcast, emotionally uncomfortable and oh, I do live podcasting. We do all the things. I love it. We'll have to do a retreat in uh, Madeira, Portugal. That'd that be would be laugh. so fun. I know. So fun. Oh, so pretty. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I really, uh, I loved it. Thank these you. Are, these are my kind of conversations. Yeah. This is where the good life happens. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Heather.